Good morning and welcome to Heritage Church as we've come together to worship our God. Special welcome if you are a guest with us this morning and we entrust that is our prayer each week when we gather. You receive a rich blessing as we worship together in this place. Worship has always existed. For the one who made this world is worthy of our worship and in his son Jesus and through the Holy Spirit he calls us together this morning to rejoice and to be glad in him. And I invite you to stand for our call to worship this morning. These words are based on Psalm 108. It's a responsive reading. Thank you, Paul. Sorry about that. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. And let your glory be over all the earth. As we gather to worship the one who is worthy of our worship, and every song we can sing greets us with these words. Grace to you and peace from God, who is our Father, from Christ, our Redeemer, and the power and the presence of the Spirit in this place. Together, God's people say, Amen. Please join me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the song that you've planted in us, a melody which rings out no matter what our circumstances may be. Some of us need your strength, for we are weary. Others of us need your leading because we've lost our way. All of us need your correction for how we have not honored your name in days past. When we sing our praise, Lord, in the same breath, we're asking you to move amid our struggles, our wandering, and our need for your grace, that our hearts may rejoice and be glad in you because you are for us in Jesus, who gave his life as a ransom. Receive our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's join our voices in worship as we sing together, How High and How Wide. 
And it is the greatness of the love of God that calls us to worship this morning. We come here this morning with confidence in God's presence. But even as we worship on the glory that God deserves, it's tempting, it's always tempting to only focus on that. But genuine worship reveals that we are not who we ought to be. We are still sinners in need of a Savior daily. And that's why confession and repentance are an integral part of how we worship here uh, on a weekly basis. For we believe that through our repentance, we embrace truly the riches of God's kingdom. As we spend some time in prayer this morning, I invite you to pray this prayer of confession uh, together with me. Together we pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, deeper than all our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes toward your purposes, our refusal to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People of God, hear the good news again this day. God's promise is that you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And when we do, we discover his grace is sufficient in Christ to those whom God redeems. That assurance is central to who we are and central to who we are becoming in Christ. As grace receivers, you are once again going to head into a new week. It will be easy to see the sin of others and to neglect our own daily need for mercy. How then should a grace-filled life be shaped in these days to come? Here we hear God's call to us to uh, hear his will. And let's do that as we read responsibly the words from the prophet Micah, the latter part, which is probably the most familiar, but listen to these words as well. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. That walk of humility is also embraced as we open God's word together in this place. I invite you to turn in a Bible with me to the book of Romans, chapter 2, which is on page 1178. Or the words again will be on our screen this morning as well. To follow Jesus, which is central to how we are experiencing our worship and our call to the, uh, the gospel itself, but to follow Jesus, Paul says in the book of Jude, one of the shortest New Testament books, he says there he wants us to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. What does Paul mean? Paul is saying in those words that there are truths that are so precious to the Christian faith so dear to the whole picture and scope of God and his gospel in Jesus that, quite frankly, they're worth contending for, which is a polite way of saying they're worth fighting for. And as history has proven, there are some who have done that to the point of even giving their own life. There are some truths that are so precious, we must contend, fight for them. Now, Paul is now writing, we're looking at the book of Romans together. We're now on chapter 2 this morning. And Paul and God's message to the church in Rome is, is that very thing. There are truths that are so precious to your walk with Jesus, you must contend for them. You must fight for them. In uh, Romans 1, verse 17, Paul says, you must be unashamed 
You must be unashamed of these truths so that, and that's where theology and life mix, be unashamed of them so that in Jesus you are honoring Christ's name in and through your walk in this world. This morning as we look at Romans 2, we're going to discover that there are a lot of threats to uh, the church, to faith, to walking with Jesus, to being a disciple. But sometimes the greatest threat to contending for the faith comes from within. Sometimes the greatest threat to the faith comes from those who know the gospel but are not convinced they need it personally. That's what Paul tackles in Romans 2. We're going to open God's Word here in a moment. Please join me, though, in prayer as we ask for the Spirit to be present here in this time. Let's pray together. God in heaven, through your Holy Spirit, come and meet our hearts in this place. We need you. We need the, the light of your truth to penetrate into the depths of who we are so that we would hear well, the call to follow Jesus in these days. Come, Holy Spirit, clear away everything else that we might saturate and soak ourselves here in this holy word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Again, the book of Romans, chapter 2. We're looking this morning at the first 16 verses. And Paul takes a significant shift from what we heard last week and is addressing a very particular audience, and that's what we'll see as we look at God's Word. But listen to that this morning. You, we don't know yet who the you is, but you, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who who hear the law, who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also being witness, and their thoughts now accusing them, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated once again. I encourage you to keep a Bible open if you have one there in front of you as we look at our text this morning. If you weren't here last Sunday, you need to know in the prior verses to our passage this morning, Paul pulls out the guns and he says, I need you to know, here's the dead aim problem of humanity, and that is we have a problem of sin. Sin shattered God's plan for shalom. And as a result, things are not the way they're supposed to be. And, and last Sunday, as we looked at the passage at the end of uh, chapter 1, we, Paul says, you know, as a result of the suppression of the truth, which sin does, we've, we've made three exchanges. We've exchanged God's glory for idols. We've exchanged the truth for a lie, and we exchange what is right 
for what is wrong. And, and his list, and you can see that if you have a Bible open, you'll see that, that Paul lists some, let's just call them the big hitter sins. There's something I want you to hear about sin as we talk about it this morning especially. Every sin is a sin, but not all sin is equally sinful. Right? Every sin is a sin, but not every sin is equally sinful. And that's part of what we're going to look at this morning as we get to this passage. Last Sunday, I uh, ended the message by reminding us that, that the good news of the gospel is that the gospel is so great, it can transform even the most wicked and awful heart and call it into discipleship with Jesus so that that life now can walk in the path of righteousness for Jesus' sake. This is the gospel which we declare. But now we get to chapter 2, verse 1, and Paul begins with the word you. And he shifts his attention and addresses a very specific group. And I want to look at that in just a moment, but here's why he does that. Paul has just shared uh, this incredible list of the wickedness of humanity. And likely by this time in life, uh, we think uh, the book of Romans was probably written around 56, uh, 57 um, A.D., and that means Paul's been a missionary for just about 25 years now, 20 to 25 years, and he's got some experience on the field, and he knows that there's always going to be objections to the gospel, but he also knows that those who hear might react as if what Paul just said about sin doesn't apply to them. Here's how that works. We hear of somebody's caught up in a bad sin, right? There's, there's some real big hitter sins out there. All sin is sin, but not all sin is equally sinful, right? There's some real bad stuff out there. Some of it's in here. We hear about somebody caught him in that sin, and he's got a big list there. And I'm reminded of this passage in, in the Gospel of Luke, and this is a parable that Jesus shares uh, to instruct God's people about the call to righteousness. And it's the parable of the, of the Pharisee and the tax collector who come to the temple to pray. And it says there, two men went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. And then you can see how the tax collector prays quite differently. Paul here in, in Romans 2, he's saying that Pharisee is us too often. We pray, God, I just heard about Sally down the road who's been uh, charged with embezzlement at the company. Or I've just heard about uh, Samuel uh, across the street who, uh, well, he cheated on his wife. I am so thankful, God, that I am not like them. This is righteousness, righteousness measured by comparison. In other words, as long as my sin is not greater than another person's sin, then I must be okay. And that's what Paul's addressing in this passage. As long as someone else's sin is greater than mine, which is, of course, completely self-opinion, all sin is sin though not all sin is equally sinful. But if my sin's not as bad as Sally or Samuel, well, then maybe God won't care about my sin. Maybe God won't judge my sin. And here in Romans 2, Paul's addressing that, that attitude that creeps in. Because in Romans 1, it seems like he's tackling the big hit sins, those who are really, I mean, these are, these are the really bad people. And then all of a sudden, Paul sets his eyes on you and me. He sets his eyes on those who think that maybe we're immune from God's judgment. You know, we're good people. My sins are little sins. They're not the big sins. Well, Paul, through God, uh, God through Paul, I should say, has a strong word. And here's the three things we're going to look at in this passage. Number one, no one is immune from God's judgment. Nobody. Number two. God's judgment is just. He doesn't play favorites. And then third, our only hope is in Christ. So let's look at the first one. Am I guilty? Number one, no one is immune from God's judgment. No one. Paul begins here, you have no excuse. Let's talk about the you for a moment. 
who is Paul addressing? Some believe that Paul is addressing uh, the Jewish uh, community of his day. A common belief in that community was that because they were God's chosen, because they were God's uh, special people, that regardless of their deeds, regardless of what they did, they believed that they were immune from God's wrath against sin. We heard earlier this morning, the prophet Micah, think about the prophets raised up by God to remind the people that it matters what you do. Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. So maybe Paul's addressing that community. I, it's possible. It's more likely, in, in my opinion, that the you in this passage is the group I just mentioned a moment ago. It's those who are members of the church, members of the community, people who think, well, my sin isn't a big deal. Members of the church who do righteousness by comparison. Right? We see all the immorality around us. Now put yourself in that day, and Paul's writing to the church in Rome, and these are, are uh, believers living in a big city that's putting a lot of pressure on them to conform. And maybe they're thinking, and I think they, Paul's addressing this, maybe they're thinking, even if subconsciously, the prayer of the Pharisee. Thank you, God, that I'm not like those Roman citizens who do a, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z. Maybe that's the prayer that's creeping up. And Paul, here in Romans 2, he just rips the blinders off of our faces. And he says, you are without excuse. You. Because to think like that, as he goes on to say, is an offense against the kindness and the tolerance and the patience of God. Of which we are all in need. All of us, all the time. Now, sadly, the scenario I'm painting is something we're far too guilty of. And I think a great example of this, actually, is from the Old Testament, and it's in the life of David. David, king of uh, Israel, also the man who had an affair with Bathsheba and, and killed his, her husband. As the story goes on to say in, in 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 12, Nathan, who's the prophet, is called by God to confront David, and uh, it's one of those great holy moments of Scripture. And Nathan decides to tell David a story. He tells him a story about a rich man, a very rich man, who took a poor man's sheep, the only sheep he owned, whom the poor man loved, and he slaughtered it, the rich man did, to feed his guests. You can read about this in 2 Samuel 12. Now, David is incensed with this sin. He's offended, he's filled with contempt, and he says there, David burned with anger against the man, and this is what he said, as surely as the Lord lives, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, you are that man. I raise this because here's an example of somebody who is immensely guilty of a far greater sin than stealing a man's sheep. But you see, he's got his blinders on, and he's enraged at the sin of another, he somehow thinks that man's sin is more offensive than his own. Now, I bring that back into our passage this morning, and this is what Paul is addressing. We are self-righteous hypocrites. We think that because God's judgment measures sin differently, that maybe my sin's not a big deal, but Paul says you need to know God's judgment is based on the truth, and you're guilty. doesn't matter how tiny your sins are, you are guilty. Which gets him to his next point. Not only are we guilty, but God's judgment is just, because now at the point you might think, well, all I stole was a couple of paper clips. I mean, my neighbor... Right, embezzlement, that's, that's got to be worse, right? Well, it is worse. All sin is sin. Some sin is more sinful, but it's still. And Paul says, I need you to know that God's judgment is just in this regard. It's just that God will give to each person according to what he has done. God is no respecter of persons. It does not matter who you are, where you are from, or what you've done. God does not show favoritism. 
It doesn't matter how, how many good things you've done for your neighbor, how much money you're giving away, how well you care for your pet. All right? If you're a follower of Christ, it doesn't matter how often you pray. It doesn't matter how often you read God's word or you talk about theology. It, it doesn't matter if your, your grandfather was a devout believer or your mother sang in the church choir or how expressively you worship on Sunday morning. God is not fooled. And as somebody I read this week said, let's remind ourselves that God does not judge on a curve. Okay? Now, if that makes your heart just a bit unsettled, which Paul is trying to do in this passage, it should. Because he goes on to say that apart from genuine repentance, which, which honestly and, and humbly acknowledges sin, uh, apart from repentance, we'll never know the joy of God's forgiveness. This is why repentance is never a one-and-done deal. I know that theology is out there. I've heard it. I've read about it. People who say, well, I asked for forgiveness when I became a Christian. Why should I keep asking for forgiveness? No, you see, the justification side of this whole equation, yes, that's finished in Christ, but the sanctification journey is a daily reminder of what we're supposed to do. Why is repentance critical? Why do we spend almost every Sunday morning pausing after a great time of worship to say, we got to be honest with God? It's not been a great week for us. We've sinned. Why do we include that repentance? Because if you fail to repent, you fail to grasp the kindness and patience and tolerance of God. And so we have to do that as part of our own work. God's judgment against sin, and every sin is a sin. I know every sin is not equally sinful, but every sin is a sin. And Paul is looking at this group who is a church some days, and says, do not be self-righteous and think that somehow you're immune. Somehow your stuff doesn't qualify for God's attention. God's judgment is just based on truth. So repent. Repent daily. Repent every day. Repent for all the things. And quite frankly, repent for the things you don't even remember sometimes. Well, that's the nature of a life of following Jesus. So Paul is looking at this group. He says, man, you're, you're without excuse. Don't you think that just because so-and-so did A, B, and C that your rest of it isn't a big deal? Don't think that for a moment. And know, for example, know precisely that when God's judgment comes, it's perfectly just against every sin. No one's immune. God's judgment is just. And now finally, the third point in this passage that Paul says, you need to know that your only hope is in Christ. It's not in your pedigree. It's not in your practices. It's not in how good you are. None of that. Your only hope, and people of God, you know, we're, we're seeking to be a light into our community and for the world. This is the light we're supposed to share. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I read this past week that uh, there was a certain Christian organization that wanted to rewrite the words of that song because they found the word wretch to be too offensive. God's judgment is just, and it's only Christ who is our hope. And here in verses 12 through 16, Paul makes clear that it's the law that tells us we've fallen short. It accuses us. And then he has this little part about the Gentiles. In other words, those who may not have ever heard the gospel. And I know that's a question young people ask, and old, older, older people too, like, what about those who haven't heard the gospel? And here Paul says, even they are without excuse, because you see, God's law is written on their hearts. Somebody who's never heard the word Jesus, nonetheless, is held to account, because God has written his law, his moral law, which we know to be contained in the Ten Commandments, but God's will and requirements, he says, it's written on every heart. People know that stealing is wrong. People know that lying is wrong. People know that cheating on your wife or husband is wrong. That's that imprinting of God's moral order naturally upon the human heart. And Paul says on the day of accounting in verse 16, 
on that day of accounting, when it takes place, on the day when God will judge people's secrets through Jesus Christ. See, and that's our hope. That God will judge us through Jesus. Why is that good news? Well, Paul says in verse 13, it's not those who hear the law who are righteous, it's those who obey the law who are righteous. Well, guess what? Only one has ever done that. It's Jesus. I look at my disobedience and my sin and my falling and failure, and I look to Jesus, the perfect Savior. That's my hope. If you follow Paul thus far, again, all who are guilty, all without excuse, and we stand before God and his law, and it says against us that it doesn't matter if you've got big hitter sins in your life, and some of you have them. It doesn't matter if you've got little small hitter sins. The verdict is clear. We read about it in Psalm 130. David says, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, who could stand? Nobody. But with you there is forgiveness. All of that just as a way for Paul to address this little church and saying, self-justification doesn't work. It doesn't work. Apart from God acting on our behalf, there is no security. And Paul is hitting that note so soundly here. Our only hope is in Christ. Our only hope. He is the one who perfectly obeyed God's law. So when Paul writes in, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's the gospel. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. People of God, I... I'm not going to say I don't care what your sin is. I do. I just know that all of us are without excuse when it comes to sin. We are all of us guilty. It doesn't matter how well you dress up here on Sunday mornings. All of us. And God's perfect justice, it's perfect. The good news is it fell completely on Jesus. All of it. He poured out his wrath at the cross. Jesus perished so that by faith we do not. And as you and I are going about our week this week, we're going to go back to work, some of us. Others of us are going to continue to enjoy this thing called retirement. Right? And as we go back to all of these different spheres of our homes and our neighborhoods and, and friends and, and, and colleagues and neighbors, as we go back, this is the message we hold. I'm a great sinner Jesus is a great Savior. I used to be in darkness. Now I'm in the light. And even though maybe my worst offense in the past week is that I gossiped about my neighbor, in God's eyes that sin deserved his judgment, but I've got Jesus. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. I, I, we don't know how big it was. We don't even know exactly how many Jews and uh, converted Jews and Gentiles are part of this faith community, but we know it's in Rome, and, and there's immense pressure for them to conform to the culture around them. And Paul says, I don't want you to be ashamed of the gospel. But having just listed all of these sins, Paul has a sense of the Spirit that maybe they haven't fully grasped this truth. They know it. They know it. They know the gospel. But maybe they haven't grasped it personally. That might be some of us this morning. Come, you hear, you think, Pastor Simon, that was the best sermon I've ever heard. And we walk out of these doors unchanged, not realizing what we just did. Some of us, I get it, that's too often the pattern. And too often it's so true in the church, right, within these walls. We look at the sin going on around us in the world, and yeah, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. But we silently pray the word of the Pharisee that says, Boy, God, thank you that I'm not like those people. And Paul says, you are those people. We are those people. And when we embrace that truth, then we see how great the gospel is for us. And why a stubborn, unrepentant heart 
A stubborn, unrepentant heart is so dangerous to your soul, so dangerous to the church. Because if we're going to be resilient, right, that's the theme of Romans. Paul says, I need you to be resilient. Don't, uh, don't be, try to be so contemporary and, and undistinguishable from the world and relevant. I want you to be resilient in the world. If we're going to be resilient, if we're going to be unashamed of the gospel, a work of humble repentance must be core to who we are. Daily repentance. Looking to Christ. Because a resilient church full of resilient believers knows that the story that I live is all about God's grace. All of it. So I'm going to practice forgiveness and I'm going to hold outstretched arms to those who are far from Jesus, and I'm going to see sin for what it is, and I'm, I'm going to trust in the power of the cross, the power of the cross to set me free, and I'm going to walk with joy with, with Jesus this week. That's a resilient church. Our world in 2,000 years has been marked by followers of Jesus who get this. They know, yep, I'm guilty. Yep, God's judgment perfectly just. He doesn't show favorites. My only hope is Christ. My only hope. I pray that that will be central to who you are as you go into your week this week. Reminding yourself daily, I'd rather have Jesus right, than anything this world can provide. I'd rather. I'd rather have Jesus because I'm a great sinner, He's a great Savior, and God's kindness, it doesn't lead me to be comfortable, it leads me to repentance. It leads me to be a repentant follower of Jesus every day. I ask for forgiveness from my spouse, from my children, from my neighbor. We ask for forgiveness from those we've offended, but ultimately to the God who loves us. That's a resilient church. A church that's making a difference for the kingdom of God. I pray that you and I, as we walk in our world this week, may that permeate our, our steps. May it just shape us. As we love our neighbor, as we, as we give our life for the one who, who gave his life for us. A lot of the support systems that we find for those who are dealing with um, addictions in life often begin with that very first statement. Hello, my name is Simon. I am, I am what? I am a sinner. I'm a sinner who has known the saving grace of Jesus. I'm a sinner who daily repents because I know the kindness and patience and tenderness of God is something I cannot take for granted. And my only hope is Christ. There is a resilient follower. And that's how a church becomes resilient. And that's Paul's prayer for the church then. It's his prayer for us today. We are without excuse if we think our sin is something God neglects. I trust that we will follow this well. And I trust that we'll hear stories, great stories, testimonies of God's goodness. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for so much not least of which is central to the story that Paul is bringing to the church then and, and we need to hear today. God, this is a gathering of sinners. We say it, we believe it, but we rest in a saving work which covers us with a righteousness we do not deserve and that's what's going to call us to go out into our world this week. Some might say, ah, you're no better than anybody. Well, in some respects, that's very, very true. Except. We serve a risen Savior. We follow a risen Redeemer. To Him we will give our allegiance in life today and sing the story of grace that is sheer beauty and wonder. Inspire us again, O oh God, to be resilient because of this gospel for the sake of Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. As we respond, I invite you to stand as we profess our faith together this morning as well. The Belgian Confession came out of the 16th century.
go ahead and stand. The 16th century, a time of great turmoil in the church in which following Jesus from a Protestant point of view was considered anathema. Many gave their lives. And so in that time, these two guys wrote this great confession of faith, which has been central to who we are as a church as well. And part of that, in Article 20, there's about 36 of them all together, Article 20 talks about the great plan of salvation. And we just simply remind ourselves of it again this morning. What do you believe about God's plan of salvation? We believe that God, who is perfectly merciful and also very just, sent His Son to assume the nature in which the disobedience had been committed, in order to bear in it the punishment of sin by His most bitter passion and death. And what do you believe about the work of Jesus Christ? We believe that Jesus Christ presented Himself in our name before His Father to appease His wrath with full satisfaction by offering Himself on the tree of the cross and pouring out His precious blood, the cleansing of our sins, as the prophets had predicted. Why did He endure all this? He endured all this for the forgiveness of our sins. And what comfort does this give to you? We find all comforts in His wounds and have no need to seek or invent any other means to reconcile ourselves with God than this one and only sacrifice, once made, which renders believers perfect forever. Amen. You may be seated. A couple of prayer announcements before we turn to prayer this morning. It's kind of a long list, actually. I want to continue to pray for Jo Wiles as she's recovering from her surgery. Uh, it's been a daily, uh, daily battle and struggle, and pray that God will grant her strength. Phil Niebuhr had surgery. He's doing well. Matt Durian had surgery. He's doing well. Uh, Evie Wenke uh, is still recovering. There's been some challenges for her after her recent surgery. I want to lift up in prayer Ken Fletcher. Spoke with Judy Fletcher this morning. He is stable, still on the ventilator still some concerns about his kidney functions. I want to pray as he remains at the COVID unit at Borges Hospital uh, for God's provision for Ken and for Judy. also want to pray this morning reminding us that uh, Ann Niebuhr is on hospice care and her health continues to decline. And uh, just pray for Nick and Ann and for what Ann longs for, which is a homecoming to be with her Savior, Jesus. So those are some prayer requests for this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, the heavens declare your glory, the skies the work of your hands, and here in this place, as we just profess together, our love and worship for all you have done for us. The promise of your word is this that those who look to you are radiant, their faces are never covered with shame. This is true, O oh God, because you set your love on us. You made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We live in a world of many distractions, never-ending demands, overstimulation. Lord Jesus, help us to cultivate a heart for you, our problem isn't the world we inhabit, but the heart that inhabits us. So we make King David's prayer our own. Give us, O God, an undivided heart that we may live in awe of your name. We intercede this morning for this community of faith, for healing, for faithfulness in our daily tasks, for compassion, for kindness to the least and the lonely and the lost. God, we ask for your continued care in the lives of those who are dealing with health concerns or, or even facing death. Sustain them with your presence and your peace, O oh God. We pray for Judy as we know she longs to sit with Ken, but cannot during this COVID season. Sustain her with the comfort that comes from your presence with her. Healing for her 
For Evie and Phil and Matt and Joe and others, may they know, O oh God, that you are with them. We trust in the riches of your kindness, O oh God. We trust in the riches of your compassion for each day. Father, we pray for a fruitful labor in your kingdom. Help us to do well the work you've called us to. Give us, give us strength to remain steadfast uh, when the journey becomes difficult. We pray uh, that your love will flourish in our homes, in uh, every marriage, in every lonely moment. Thank you, God, for opportunities to serve our community in Jesus' name, for the International Student Luncheon this past Thursday, for the upcoming Mobile Food Initiative on Saturday, and, God, for the daily call to, to be your light in our community. We intercede for our world, for the hurting and the hopeless and the helpless. Draw near to all who call on you today, God. For all those who do not see hope for tomorrow, grant them your peace. Lord, we pray for your church which gathers around the world. May it truly be resilient in the way of Jesus. Trusting, O oh God, that you work for the good of those who love you and who keep your commandments. And we pray this morning for family and friends who do not have faith. We talked this morning about the joy of the gospel and the the great comfort of Christ and the gift of repentance and trusting in you, but there are so many who do not have that very hope. We pray, O oh God, that through the work of your Holy Spirit and, and through that road of repentance that you would move their hearts to give them a thirst for the one who is seeking them, to trust that he is able, more than able, to carry them through life with unimaginable joy and comfort. Thank you, O oh God, that you know what we need even before we ask it. Thank you that when we ask in Jesus' name that you receive us. And now as we prepare to go from this place once again, charged by these words from Romans to not deceive ourselves about our own sin, but to declare, O oh God, that you are faithful and just and have provided the means of grace. Lord, may we go here as your people who know by grace that it is well with our soul. Do this, O God, for the glory of your church, the glory of Christ, and the glory of your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of announcements uh, before we come to the close of our service. A thank you to all those who help volunteer or donate food items for the International Student Luncheon. I did get an email from uh, Jordan Palladino, one of the campus uh, chaplains. Uh, they estimate they had around 50 people show up for this luncheon, and they had more than enough food from our congregation, and uh, grateful to you for that and for the ministry that we could do uh, to support um, reaching out to international students at Western. A reminder that uh, we do publish our weekly newsletter. You can find it online on our website, or maybe you got it, received it via email. Be sure to check that out for some ministry events and items happening uh, in and around us, including uh, tonight we once again return to our evening service. So come and join us at 5 o'clock as we have an opportunity to open God's Word uh, once again. Our offerings this morning, which are received at the door on your way out of the sanctuary, uh, supporting the ministry of this church, as well as Faith Promise, which is our, our mission branch of our church to reach to the ends of the earth. And then our loose change offering supports uh, my alma mater, Calvin Theological Seminary, uh, founded in 1876 as a way and a place to uh, form Christian leaders for ministry. So that'll be our loose change offering this morning. Invite you to stand as we come to the end of our service, but an opportunity to serve our God in the days to come as he calls us. We trust and I trust that through God's word this morning you were reminded that um, we are not without excuse, but we are called in Christ to proclaim good news of great joy that is for all people. Hear this gospel again, which is for you. Receive God's blessing, and then following that, we will sing together, I will sing of my Redeemer. God's blessing comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. <laughs> 
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And together, God's people say, Amen.